Hello everybody. In today's session, we shall discuss about the concept of group dynamics. This topic is relevant for the first year students of MBA under the subject organization and management process. The elements for discussion are 1. The concepts of group and dynamics, the theories of group formation, the classification of groups, the process of group development, the functions of group, the group behavior and the group structure. Well, it is generally said that 2 is a company, 3 is a crowd. But for the purpose of our discussion, we shall take 2 or more as a group. As a social being, a human being is born into groups, he lives with groups, he extends his groups, he continuously forms new groups. Fine, what is a group? Let us now see some formal definitions for a group. Horton and Hunt have defined groups as aggregates of categories of people who have a consciousness of membership and interaction. Arnold Green has defined the group as an aggregate of individuals which persists in time, which has one or more interests and activities in common and which is organized. Now, the essence of these definitions gives us G relates to goal orientation that is the members in the group have something common to pursue. 2. Relationships that is in the process of their interaction in pursuing their common goals they develop formal and informal relationships. The third aspect is organized and conducted. It is not haphazard movement or haphazard behavior of the people we discuss about under the group. The fourth element is unified action that is all the members of the group in their working are united. There are no diverse activities even if there are they are towards one common goal that is the relevance of unified action. The most important of the characteristic is the perception about the existence of a group and one's membership in it. That is, each person should recognize the existence of the group and remember that he is a part of that particular group. The concept of group can be better understood in comparison with other terms like mob, crowd and aggregation. Now, what is an aggregation? It is a collection of people at one place, but there is no interaction between them. They do not have any common purpose. A crowd on the other hand are people who assemble at one place. They respond to a common stimuli, but there is no interaction again. Even if there is, it is minimal and not any purpose oriented. A mob is an unruly crowd, which is negatively provoked. In other words, we can define group as an association of two or more people who interact with each other on a continuous basis for the pursuit of a common goal. Now, coming to the concept of dynamics, the concept of dynamics has taken from the physical sciences which refers to forces. Now, its relevance in the social sciences particularly in the study of human beings refers to the forces that act within the individual like the cultural forces, the re religious forces, the political forces, all of which make the behavior of the individual a complex one. In other words, man is a complex human being. When such is the case for a single individual, we can understand dynamic forces that act in a group behavior wherein different people behave in different ways under different situations. It is for this purpose we have to understand the concept of group dynamics. Now, when we are discussing about the concept of group dynamics, we are referring to the groups at the workplace, 
because the groups vary from uh, the small unit of a family which is a group of family members and we are now focusing more on the groups at workplace. The study of group dynamics is viewed from three different angles. One, group dynamics is treated as a normative view that is it studies about how the groups should be organized and conducted with focus on democratic leadership, overall cooperation and the member participation. The second view is group dynamics is treated as a set of techniques which includes role playing, brainstorming and group therapy such as. The third angle which is of relevance for our discussion is the changes that take place in a group. How groups change? Why do they change? What motivates them to change? And under what conditions do they change? And in what direction do they change? These are the aspects of relevance for the present discussion. The present discussion provides a background for understanding this particular angle. For the purpose of clarity, the groups are classified in different ways. One, primary and secondary groups. Two, membership and reference groups. Three, in groups and out groups. Four, interacting, co-acting and counteracting groups. Five, open and closed groups. Six, community and association. Seven, formal and informal groups. The primary groups refer to the face to face interaction between individuals in a group. In other words, a group is called as primary when people, the members of the group meet each other on a regular basis. They have face to face interaction. On the other hand, the secondary group generally is large in size. The association of the member with the group is only in relation to their value systems and there may not be interaction between the people. The second category being membership and reference groups. The membership group refers to that group in which the individual is a member. On the other hand, the reference group means the group with which he relates himself. He wants to be as a member of that particular group. For example, a middle income group person. He, he is a member of the middle income group, whereas if he is aspiring to be rich, he always refers himself. For him, the rich class becomes the reference group. The third category that is in groups and out groups. In group is the group with which the individual identifies himself, that is a family or a tribe, etc. Ethnocentrism, that is, the group is everything, that is the center of activity for the group. Every other group is rated or referred in terms of this particular group. Now, out group is re, uh, defined in relation to in group, that is, in contrast to the in group, it is identified. For example, a couple, they are the members of a family as husband and wife. For example, both of them are software engineers or both of them are lecturers working in two different organizations. From the organization point of view, each of them becomes the member of out group for one another. Next classification is interacting, co-acting and counteracting groups. Interacting depends on the sequence of activities. Unless the activities of one group are complete, the second group cannot take up its activities as is prevalent in processing industries. Co-acting means simultaneously the activities of different groups take place. There is no dependence on the activities of the previous group. On the other hand, the contracting groups, they interact with each other to reach a reconciliation as in case of 
union management relationships. A reconciliation has to be reached if there should be a smooth flowing of work in the organization between the management and union groups. Open and closed groups. Now this term open group is in relation to the open system that is followed. That is, you accept input from the external environment and give out the output to the external environment. Since the dependence is on the external environment, there will always be a constant change in the group, be it in its membership or in the goals that are to be defined. In other words, the open group is susceptible to change, instability. On the other hand, a closed group, it has no connection with the external environment. It works within. It's relatively stable and it has its own established power and relations. Coming to the terms community and association. Community, say by virtue of living in a particular area or by virtue of uh, belonging to a particular caste or creed, the group of people will be termed as a community. On the other hand, association means a group of individuals to which the individual voluntarily joins, say a cultural association or a club, a sports club. The final classification is, that is formal and informal groups. This classification is of more relevance in the context of organizational behavior. No doubt the different classifications that have been mentioned are overlapping and they have their bearing on the behavior of the individuals in the organization. In the organizational context, the focus is more on formal and informal groups. The differences between the formal and informal groups can be understood in terms of their origin, authority, purpose, size, nature, the number of groups, the behavior of group members, communication and ultimately the abolition of the group itself. The formal groups are deliberately created, they have a formal structure of authority, formal structure of communication, they may be quite large in size, they are more or less stable, they depend on the organizing pattern. They are, the members behavior is governed by rules and regulation with emphasis on rationality and efficiency. Ultimately, the groups can be closed at any time, the way they are brought into existence through the process of organization, the same way they can be abolished through the organization process. On the other hand, the informal groups being a product of the formal groups, they exercise only personal authority, they, are, they come into existence for personal need satisfaction, they are generally small in size, they are unstable because we do not know which member leaves the group when and for what. The number of groups, may, groups also may be large. It is the norms, beliefs and values of the group which govern the behavior of the members and they generally make use of the grapevine that is the informal channel of communication and ultimately it is difficult to abolish an informal group. The reason, so long as the group is able to satisfy the personal needs of the members, the members re remain as the members of that particular group. They cannot be abolished. Since a very long time, an attempt is made to understand the process of group formation. The first and foremost proposition being that of the Hawthorne studies. Later, Levin has proposed the most fundamental theory that is the theory of propinquity. The term propinquity means the spatial or geographical nearness of people. That is, it is observed that people tend to form into groups by virtue of working at one place. The second theory is called as social systems theory which explains the group formation which is based on the interaction of the people. 
by virtue of having assigned tasks that is activities people interact with each other now in the interaction it is not only work related interaction but also the sentiments of people come into picture here the focus is more on sentiments of the people which influence both formal working as well as informal interactions the third theory relates to the exchange theory here the focus is on what is the outcome of the interactions is it a gratifying one or is it something which results in frustration fatigue by being a member of that particular group say if you are not treated properly if the other members are not cordial or helpful you may experience some fatigue mental fatigue and frustration for not being identified with the group so based on the outcome it can be a reward outcome that is a gratifying one which satisfy the needs of the people or a cost oriented outcome that is a fatigue oriented result finally the balanced theory of group formation here the members who have homogeneous needs homogeneous desires or homogeneous likings they form into a particular group any differences get automatically removed by virtue of homogeneity in their activities or in their uh, aspirations and mental process until now we have discussed about what is a group what are the different types of groups and the theories that have been proposed regarding the group formation let us now try to understand the processes through which the groups are formed there are basically four stages through which the group formation takes place prior to the first stage there is a stage called pre stage where the members are strangers they do not know each other they just are at one place they are it to may, uh, establish a communication between themselves just think of a classroom a regular cla classroom in a college the first day of admission when the college has started the students as they enter their classroom they do not know each other they have to make friends they have to wish each other and make friends stage 1 is called as the forming stage that is people get to know each other until then there is uncertainty about why and how they are at particular place the interpersonal relationships get established and the members perceive themselves as members of a particular group say the students of mba first year or students of bcom first year the second stage is called as storming stage that is no leader is yet elected there is slight competition there is some conflict between them as to who should be the leader of the group this stage is so called as storming the third stage where a single leader emerges it's called as norming stage by virtue of having a single leader the group cohesion is established the strong sense of identity is established and new group standards and values are created and stage 4 is the actual performing stage where there is teamwork each member of the group understands what they have to do how they have to interact with the other members of the group and hence there is role clarity and accomplishment of the task becomes easy in the context of understanding group behavior two aspects require special attention one is social loafing the second one is group think the social loafing has an adverse effect on task accomplishment because each member thinks that the others are there to take the workload why should i and thus tries to be away from the responsibility on the other hand group think where all the members of the group think alike they even try to sacrifice their personal demands for the purpose of attaining the organizational goal whether it is social loafing or group think 
the group behavior depends on certain aspects. They are one, what are the group tasks? What are the group norms? What is the group cohesion? How the group decision making takes place? And apart from this, some external conditions. The group task can be categorized in three different aspects. One is based on time frame, that is, whether short term task or long term uh, task. Then, task requirements, whether they are of routine nature or complex in nature. Then, what are the task objectives, whether it is showing some output, that is, production, or is it only discussion? or is, is it for solving a specific problem. Now, to attain these tasks, group norms are established. That is, group norms refers to, refer to the rules of behavior or proper ways of action, which are ac accepted as legitimate by other members of the group. Now, coming to group cohesion, greater the interaction, greater should be the cohesion. In relation to size, we can say smaller the size of the group, greater is the cohesion. The larger the size, the possibility of subgroups coming up and hence an adverse effect on the cohesion of the group. Now, what is cohesion? It is a state of being together, identity, the forces which make the people to be together as a part of the group. Now, coming to group decision making, it depends on what is the nature of the problem to be solved, whether or not the decision taken is mandatory on the members and what is the time availability for taking the decisions. The external conditions relate to the procurement of personnel, particularly how the retirement process takes place and for what reasons, if any, employees are retrenched, the old employees are retrenched and to what extent or the what is the process of recruiting the new employees. This affects the membership composition, the changes take place in the membership of the group that affects the cohesion or the group behavior. Let us now see the relationship between the group performance norms, the group cohesiveness and their effect on the performance levels of the group. When we observe the variables of group cohesiveness and the performance norms and the degree of variance in terms of high and low in each of this, that gives way for four levels of performance. For example, if the group cohesiveness is high, that is each member of the group is committed to the group goals and the performance norms are also high, then that leads to a high level performance. On the other hand, the performance norms are high, but there is no group cohesiveness. That is, there is a little bit of say indifference attitude of the members in the group that may lead to a medium level performance. If the performance norms are low, but though the cohesiveness is high, which means that group as a unit is working efficiently to achieve the norms, but the norms are low. So, that leads to low performance. Finally, if group cohesiveness is low as well as the performance norms are also low, that also leads to low performance levels. While well, the performance levels of a group depend on the group cohesiveness and the norms that are set. The performance levels of the organization as a whole depend on the intergroup behavior, which may be pooled interdependence, sequential interdependence, reciprocal interdependence and team interdependence. Whether it is an individual group's behavior or intergroup behavior, they depend on the organization structure or the group structure wherein the roles of the individual members and their statuses are defined. Under the roles, we, under the concept roles, we need to understand the concept of 
role expectation, role perception, role system and role stress. The term status refers to the rank assignment and the perquisites or the status symbols that go along with it. The status can be of different types, ascribed or achieved, scholar and functional, positional and personal, active or latent. However, status is a high strata term that is used, but it has its own problems. The problems mainly relate to status incongruency and status discrepancy. In essence, it may be said that groups are inevitable in an organization. While the formal groups are created by the organizational structure itself, informal and small groups which are created by individuals are inevitable. However, there is no need for fear or anxiety. All that is to be done is understand their group behavior, the intergroup behavior and take measures to build or increase the group cohesiveness for the attainment of the organization's objectives.